This podcast may not be suitable for young listeners. Chapter 17, Vision Quest. The Great Spirit is not perfect. It has a good side and a bad side. Sometimes the bad side gives us more knowledge than the good side. Lakota Sioux. The next thing Will knew, he was running through the forest chasing prey. There was a rush of power running through him and it felt glorious. He was following the coppery, sweet smell of blood and it took a moment to realize that he was running far faster than he ever had before. He was flying through the underbrush and leaping over fallen trees with ease. The scent was growing stronger and he knew it was close. Ahead of him, he could hear the rushing of water. His prey was going to try to elude him in the river. Pushing harder, he accelerated rapidly. They were not going to escape. He would not be denied his kill. Bursting through the trees, he emerged into a small clearing. His prey was there, attempting to reach the rushing waters of the river. Bounding across the clearing in four bounding strides, he was leaping through the air. Teeth bared, he was going for the throat of his prey. And in an instant, he saw that the bloody animal he'd been chasing was no animal. It was Sarah. Time seemed to freeze as his perception took in everything around him. He saw his own reflection in the water, moving in slow motion toward Sarah. He wasn't seeing his own reflection. He was seeing a massive, gray-furred beast. He was one of the Alonga Daglala, and he was the new Alpha. Will awoke with a start to a dark and still house. He was covered in sweat after having an intensely vivid dream. He was still in the recliner, and although he could hear the soft breathing of the others, no sound broke the silence other than the soft crackling of the fire. There was a strong smell of burning oak in the air, and Sarah was asleep on a bedroll near the fireplace, sleeping peacefully. Will could see the hands of the antique grandmother clock near the kitchen, illuminated in the pale moonlight, streaming in through the windows. It was just after three in the morning. Despite the crackling fire in the fireplace, Will felt a chill to the air. It wasn't just chilly. It was as if there was an open window letting in the outside air. Glancing around, Will saw that the sliding glass door was open, leading out to the deck. Silhouetted in the silvery light was the figure of his grandfather standing by the rail and staring out into the darkness. Slipping out of the chair, Will tried to make as little noise as possible to avoid waking the others. Standing and gliding across the floor, his bare feet made hardly a whisper. Once he was out on the deck, he took a spot beside his grandfather and gazed in the same direction that he was fixed on. And they stood in silence for a long time, neither wishing to break the stillness of the moment. As Will's eyes adjusted to the change in light, he began to see what his grandfather was fixed upon. And across the hollow, there was movement high up on the ridge. It was where they had found the cave the Alonga Daglala were using as a den. What is that? whispered Will. Without turning his head, Grandfather whispered back, Coyotes. Why are they there? asked Will, frowning. They are scavengers, explained Grandfather. It means the Olonga Daglala have left that place and will not return. Where have they gone? asked Will, leaning against the rail beside his grandfather. Not far, I suspect, replied Grandfather. They will want to regain their strength before coming for us again. Then we're going to have to track them down, said Will, glancing around in the trees that bordered the small yard. We must first heal and you still have to survive the Anippi, said Grandfather. I will, answered Will confidently. Do not be so sure of yourself, Grandfather said, turning to face Will. This will be one of the most dangerous tasks you've ever faced. I don't underestimate it, Grandfather, Will said, locking eyes with his Grandfather. I simply have no other choice. 
I will not fail you. I will not fail all of you. I know you won't, said Grandfather, smiling. Reaching out a reassuring hand, he patted Will on the cheek and smiled. I will make some coffee and wake the others, said Grandfather, turning and heading into the house. It's time to prepare the fire for the Anippi. Will followed him inside and headed toward his chair. He saw Sarah was already awake and waiting for him. She smiled as he approached, but there was a deep sadness in her eyes. Are you ready? she asked, holding out her hand. It's time, said Will, whether I'm ready or not. Will could hear the others beginning to stir. Easing into the chair, he began slipping his boots on. Zipping the sides of the tactical boots, he got slowly to his feet. The pain was subsiding, but still strong enough to make him wince when he moved in certain ways. It was clear that he was far from healed. Moments later, he could smell the coffee beginning to brew. Most of the others were now up around and moving. A line had formed at the bathroom door. Walking over to the counter, Will picked up a coffee cup to wait for the ancient metal percolator to finish its job. Grandfather didn't believe in using an automatic drip coffee machine. He didn't trust modern methods for something as important as coffee. Coffee is the only good thing the white man ever gave to our people, his grandfather used to say jokingly. Well, that and the sharp's rifle. At least Will thought he was joking. It was not uncommon for Grandfather to have a mischievous sense of humor. His humor and wisdom were gifts he would gladly share with anyone. After being lost in his thoughts for a few moments, Will was surprised when his cousin Jason picked up the coffee pot and poured the first cup. Wake up, cousin, he said, laughing. Doze off and you missed the first cup. As do you, said Grandfather, as he picked up Jason's cup before he could retrieve it from the counter. Laughing, Will held out his cup for Jason to fill. I won't set this one down, said Will, smiling. You better not, replied Jason. Someone might sneak up and steal it. Filling his own cup, Jason headed for the back door. Time to get the fire going, he said as he walked away, his moccasin boots making no noise on the floor. Taking a seat next to his grandfather at the dining room table, Will took a long sip of his coffee. He closed his eyes in pleasure and he smiled as he sat the cup down on the placemat. Grandfather, said Will, I've always loved your coffee, but this is the best I've ever tasted. What did you do differently? Grandfather set his cup down and studied Will closely, his eyes narrowing. How does it smell? asked Grandfather. Rich and wonderful, replied Will, not noticing the change in his grandfather's tone. It's intoxicating. Whatever you changed, it smells better than ever. Huh, mused Grandfather. That's strange. What's strange? asked Sarah. Will's senses are growing stronger, said Grandfather, not taking his eyes off Will. Why did you say that? Will asked, opening his eyes. Because that coffee recipe hasn't changed in four generations, explained Grandfather. It's the same ingredients I used yesterday. Well, what does that mean? said Will, frowning. It means that we need to hurry, said Grandfather. You are already showing signs of change. If you do not challenge the spirit of the Olonga Daglala, then it will take over. How long do I have? asked Will, setting his coffee cup down. Most likely until moonrise, answered Grandfather, if you're lucky. Then we don't have much time to waste, said Sarah. How long until the Anippi is ready? Jason is making the necessary preparations as we speak, explained Grandfather. It will take a while for the stones to heat up properly. Then I need to prepare myself, said Will, forcing himself to his feet. Will headed toward the stairs that led down to the lower level with Sarah right behind him. He would need to bathe and braid his hair. The Sinippi was as much about purification of the spirit as it was about purifying the body. After a long hot shower, Will stepped out and began toweling off. Once he had dried himself, he wiped the fog away from the mirror. 
He could see the puckered scars of the bullet wounds along the more jagged scars left by the shrapnel. However, those were all old scars. There were no scars from the wounds he'd received from the Alpha Wolf. It was as if they had never happened. Laid out for him was a loincloth made from doe skin along with a pair of moccasin boots. He slipped into them and felt the softness of the skins. Without a word, Sarah slipped into the bathroom behind him and rubbed her hands along his scarred shoulders. I'm here to braid your hair, Grey Eagle, she said, her eyes locked with his in the mirror. Nodding to proceed, Will said nothing, only met her gaze and tried to remain stoic. When she took up the brushes and began brushing out his hair, he held still. Switching to a set of wooden combs, she began to separate his hair into different strands, and beginning on the left, she began braiding his long black hair into a warrior's braid. Will said nothing during the entire process. Once completed, he gazed in the mirror. He almost didn't recognize himself. Instead of Will the cop, he was looking at a man out of time. He was looking at himself as Great Eagle, the Lakota warrior. Although it seemed strange, it also felt right. This is who he was destined to be all along. He felt that now. Nodding gravely to Sarah, he turned and walked out the door. Sarah followed behind him but said nothing for fear of breaking his concentration. She didn't want to tell him how afraid she was for him or that she wanted to go with him. She didn't want anything to distract him. Once he exited the back of the house, he barely felt the stinging cold that bit into his flesh. It had to be well below zero outside, but he felt warm inside. The cold did not bother him. Rounding the corner of the house to where the lodge had been built for the Anippi, he saw only Jason tending the fire and Mika playing a single drum. The others were nowhere to be seen. Will felt the drum as much as he heard it. Strange, but it seemed to be beating in exact synchronicity with his heart. He glanced over his shoulder and he saw that Sarah had not followed him outside. Without further hesitation, he headed for the lodge. Briefly, he made eye contact with both Jason and Mika and each met his gaze and then lowered theirs in respect after a moment. Turning to the entrance flap, Will ducked low and entered the lodge. It was already thick with steam and incense. He could smell sage and sweet grass mixed with other herbs that he had smelled before but could not name. And in the center was a pile of large heated stones arranged in a pyramid. And across from him was his grandfather, dressed exactly like him. Taking his seat, Will could already begin to see the shapes moving through the mist, and he thought that strange since he had not drunk any of the sacred peyote yet. Colors formed and swirled through the mist. Images of animals, both strange and familiar, moved through the mist. Through the ever-thickening mist, it was now very hard to see the face of his grandfather. And sweat was pouring from his body now, running in thick rivulets down his face and chest. It felt good, and it felt right. Darkness began to swirl through the mist, and his vision began to fade. And in the distance, he heard a wolf howl into the darkness. He felt it in his chest, and in his bones, and in his soul. And it howled again, and he realized that it wasn't coming from the darkness in the lodge. It was coming from the darkness within him. Softly, he could hear his grandfather chanting in Lakota. It seemed to come from a great distance, only he knew that he was only a few feet away. The words were indistinct, and he could only follow the tune, and the words escaped him, but they rang in his subconscious. They resonated with him and within him. Then, between blinks of his eyes, the scene changed completely. He was no longer in the lodge, but in the wind-swept prairie. There was a large campfire in front of him, and he could hear a horse snort nearby. The stars above him seemed to stretch out to infinity. 
The light of the fire and the light of the stars were the only points of light he could see. Greetings, warrior, said a voice. Will looked around in confusion, searching for the source. There was no one there. Only an old gray fox sat there at the edge of the firelight. May I join you? asked the fox, nodding at the fire. It would be impolite to refuse, said Will cautiously. Padding up to the fire, the fox took a seat across the fire and slightly to Will's right side. His eyes were gleaming in a vivid yellowish green and seemed to look right through him. Have you been waiting long? asked the fox. Not really, answered Will, still looking skeptically at the fox. Good, said the fox. That's good. I wouldn't want you to get bored or anything. Will didn't answer. He was still trying to accept the fact that the fox was talking to him in the first place. At first, his mind told him that this was just a vision, but they had never been this clear before. This felt real. So what are you going to do? asked the fox, cocking his head to the side. About what? Will replied. About what? he asks, chided the fox mockingly. Why, about the Alonga Daglala, of course. How do you know about that? asked Will defensively. I am Fox, said Fox, as if that explained everything. Will tried to remember everything he had been told about the fox by his grandfather. Are you the swift fox? asked Will. I think you're thinking of someone else, answered Fox, licking his gray paw. Will frowned slightly. Why the riddles? asked Will. What riddles? replied Fox innocently. I've asked you no riddles. Who are you then? demanded Will. I am Fox, said Fox, as if that explained everything again. What do you want? said Will, his patience growing thin. To be your guide, explained Fox. If you will follow me, I will teach you all that you need to know about the Olonga Daglala. At first, Will started to get up to follow the fox, but something stopped him. Something seemed to whisper to him on the breeze that this was too easy. I think I'll wait a bit, answered Will, his tone growing more guarded. Suit yourself, said Fox, laughing. I'm the best option you've got, boy. You won't like the others. We will see, said Will. As if on cue, Will felt another presence approaching in the darkness. This one was preceded by a deep rumbling growl. Will could see glowing yellow eyes approaching the edge of the firelight. Well, rumbled a deep voice, what are you waiting for? Invite me in or be done with this. Will glanced at Fox, but Fox just looked bored. He's not talking to me, boy, explained Fox. Tell me who you are and you can join us at the fire, said Will. I am Sunk Manitou Tonka, said the deep growling voice. I am Wolf. A gigantic black wolf emerged from the darkness and took a place across the fire slightly to Will's left. It was strange that they formed a personal triangle at the fire. Hello, brother, said Fox mockingly. I'm no brother of yours, snarled Wolf menacingly. What do you want? Ask Will without preamble. Follow me and learn the true power of the Alonga Daglala, said Wolf, his yellow eyes gleaming in the firelight. Follow him to the path of the savage beast, said Fox, licking its paw. And your path is superior, mocked Wolf. You know nothing of the truth. The truth has never passed your lips, brother. You'll have to choose one of us, boy, said Fox. Tell me, do you really want to choose this idiot over me? This idiot will rip the flesh from your bones, snarled Wolf. Only if you can catch me, mocked Fox, and we both know you can't. Why should I choose either of you, asked Will. Whether by choice or by not making a choice, said Fox with a smirk on his face, you will take one of the paths offered to you. However, if you do not choose, one will be chosen for you. 
Will searched his memory for the old tales that he had not thought of in years. He tried to remember the stories his grandfather told him over the campfires many years ago. He remembered that Swift Fox was a revered animal among his people, but Fox said that wasn't him. Then who was he? Wolf was easier to figure out, a simpler solution. Wolf was raw power and ferocity, the nature of the beast itself. As tempting as it seemed, Will knew that the path of the wolf was to surrender to the bestial nature of the Alonga Daglala. Fox was the one he couldn't figure out. In Wolf was bad, and then maybe Fox was the path he must take. He knew that Fox was smarter than Wolf, and he understood that it was intelligence that made the Olonga Daglala truly dangerous. Across the fire, Fox was smiling. It was as if it sensed his thoughts, as if it knew what he was thinking. And then, on a gentle breeze, Will heard soft chanting. It came as if from a great distance away. It was only there at the edge of his hearing. Straining to hear the words, Will closed his eyes. What? asked Fox, trying to talk loudly. Don't listen to that, boy. Make your choice. In that moment, Will knew that his destiny depended on that song. If only he could recall the words. The tune was distant and vague, and it appeared and vanished like the wisps of smoke in the fire, like swirling mist, like steam. Steam, Will thought, his mind screaming in triumph. The tune became clearer and filled his mind, as if of his own accord the song burst from Will's throat, softly at first and then growing in intensity and power. As the last notes and the final words faded into the darkness, Will felt renewed, rejuvenated in ways he could not explain. He felt the fire welling up from within him. Opening his eyes, he could see both Fox and Wolf had moved closer to him. And at first, he thought it was to attack, but then he saw that it was to make room for another figure at the fire. Directly across from Will, a gigantic gray eagle sat perched on a log. It flapped its wings and shrieked twice before folding its wings against its body. It began cocking its head from side to side, studying everyone there. What do you want, Anankasan? demanded Fox. No one asked you to be here. In lieu of an answer, Anankasan cocked its head and stared directly at Will. Choose, boy, snarled Wolf, but if you choose poorly, I will strip the flesh from your bones and devour you. Don't choose that beast, squealed Fox. I'm faster and smarter. I'll show you your destiny. Will could see that both Wolf and Fox were making their way toward him around the fire. Anand Costin gazed at him briefly and then began flapping its great wings and launched into the night sky. Will followed the path of the Anankasan, watching him glide easily toward the stars. He felt the cool rush of the wind against him and he could see far into the distance, and below him he could see Wolf and Fox looking around the now empty space where Will had once been. No longer was he watching Anankasan, he was flying through the thin clouds. He was Anankasan. Swooping around in a great arc, he could see the firelight below him, and Wolf leaped toward Fox, but Fox was too fast, and soon both vanished into the night with Wolf pursuing Fox into the darkness. Turning over on his left wing, Will felt himself diving toward the firelight, and streaking towards it at an ever-increasing speed. At first, he was afraid he was going to crash directly into it, but something calmed him, A feeling of serenity washed over him, and he knew that he had chosen the correct path. The light of the fire became all-encompassing, and the darkness was gone. And in a flash of white-hot light, he felt the rough ground beneath him again. There was intense heat, but also the familiar smell of sage and sweet grass and other herbs. He was back in the sweat lodge. As his vision became clear and the mist began to part, 
He saw that he was alone in the sweat lodge. He was seated near the door, and there was no way that Grandfather could have exited without touching him. Yet he was completely alone in the lodge. And rising to his knees, Will turned and exited the lodge. The overcast sky gleamed a dark gray and large snowflakes filled the air. Jason still tended the fire and Mika was still beating the drum. Both froze as Will emerged from the lodge. The last rumbling note of the drum faded out into the distance, rolling along the valley below them. Anan Kassin, said Will, and then dropped to his knees. Falling in slow motion, he saw the snow-covered ground rushing up to meet him, and then the darkness took him. Chapter 18 Anan Kassin When you are in doubt, be still and wait. And when doubt no longer exists for you, then go forward with courage. So long as mists envelop you, be still. Be still until the sunlight pours through and dispels the mists, as it surely will. And then act with courage. Chief White Eagle Well awoke on the floor of the living room in his grandfather's house. There was a soft pillow beneath his head, and he was stretched out next to the fireplace. There was a warm fire crackling, and he could feel it on his skin. Looking up, he saw that the soft pillow was Sarah cradling his head in her lap. He smiled up at her, grateful for her presence. Glancing around, he saw that everyone was gathered around him. Waiting for him to wake up, Grandfather was seated on the hearth next to the fire to his right. Mika was seated next to Grandfather, but closer to his head. The others were gathered around, some seated in chairs, and some were standing. Welcome home, said Grandfather. I think I can safely say that you chose wisely. How do you know? asked Will, his voice weak and raspy. Sarah brought a glass of water to his lips, and he drank enough to moisten his mouth. And giving her a smile of gratitude, she lowered the glass. Because you are here with us, replied Grandfather. Had you chosen poorly, then what emerged from the lodge would no longer have been you. What would you have done then? asked Will. We would have done our best to stop you, replied Mika. I'm happy that it didn't come to that. Well, me too, said Will. When you emerged from the lodge, said Grandfather, you spoke only one word before you collapsed. Do you remember that word? Anunkasen, answered Will. It means eagle in our language, explained Grandfather, glancing at Doc. Thanks, said Doc. I was starting to think that I was the only one here who didn't know what it meant. It is a Lakota word, said Maria, smiling at Doc. I am Chiriqua Apache. I didn't know it either. That drew a few laughs from the crowd. Well, thanks, said Doc, returning the smile. Now I don't feel so bad. You need not feel bad in any way, said Grandfather. You are part of this, too. Your destiny led you here just as ours did. Tell us what you saw in your vision, said Grandfather, looking back at Will. Will closed his eyes for a moment to let the memories return, and after a long pause to reflect, Will began to tell the tale of his vision. He left out no details. And after he finished, he took a deep cleansing breath and let all the tension go from his body. He felt Sarah stroking his hair and cheek. He felt at peace, and all of the pain he had felt before was gone. That's amazing, said Mika. When did you figure out Gray Fox is a trickster? I didn't really, explained Will. I just knew what he was telling me sounded good, but was too good to be true. And the wolf, asked Doc. There was just something sinister about the wolf, explained Will. I knew it was the more powerful of the two, but it was dark and savage. Things I don't want to be. That's why Anunkinson came to you, said Grandfather. Anunkinson is the spirit of the eagle, and the fact that it appeared gray to you is the key. You, in essence, chose to remain you. Then that explains your hair, said Sarah. What about my hair? asked Will, reaching up and touching the top of his head. There are streaks of gray in your hair that weren't there yesterday, said Sarah. 
Well, what does that mean? asked Will, turning to face Grandfather. It is an indication of the strain your body went through fighting off the spirit of the Olonga Daglala, replied Grandfather. The real question is, how do you feel? Well, I feel fine, said Will. Uh, a bit weak, but I'm fine. And your senses, asked Mika, is everything still stronger? Yes, replied Will, but it feels different now. Different, asked Mika. How? Before there was a hunger that I felt, explained Will, like a darkness inside of me, and it's gone now. That was the spirit of the Olonga Daglala, replied Grandfather. It is a good sign that you no longer feel its presence. Will started to try to get up, but struggled. Mika extended his arm and Will grasped it, clasping his forearm in his hand. With effort, Will got to his feet while Mika steadied him. I've got you, man, said Mika. Guiding Will to the table, Mika helped him settle into a chair by the window that overlooked the Niangwa River Valley below. Sarah went into the kitchen and returned with a steaming mug of coffee. Gently placing it in the placement in front of Will, she smiled at him. And slipping into the chair beside him, Sarah took his hand and held it between both of hers. And with his free hand, Will took a long sip of coffee. Sighing in contentment, he leaned back in the chair and sat the coffee back on the placemat. Thank you all, he said after a moment. I couldn't have survived any of this without you all. Destiny brought us all together, said Grandfather, and you will see this through. Of that I have no doubt. One way or another, added Minka. I prefer the way that lets us survive, said Doc. This drew a round of laughter from the room. The tension broken, everyone began to visibly relax. Let's get some food started, said Jason, heading into the kitchen. I've got about 20 pounds of ground buffalo in the fridge. Who's up for some big-ass buffalo burgers? Grabbing a big stainless steel mixing bowl from the cabinet, Jason took out four large packages wrapped in white butcher paper. And opening them one at a time, he dumped the ground meat into the bowl. Then he began adding eggs and spices and herbs to the mix. Once it was all added, he kneaded it all together and then began making large hamburger patties from it. Kaylee and Melissa began helping him, and once the patties were all pressed, Jason washed his hands and headed out onto the deck to light the barbecue grill. Isn't it a bit cold to barbecue? asked Doc. It's never too cold to barbecue, replied Jason with a chuckle. I barbecued in a snowstorm before. He's not lying, added Will. I was there. Soon everyone was up, adding extra hands to the preparation of the meal. And some handled the bread and condiments while others sliced onions and tomatoes. Sarah started making a big batch of potato salad. And after a while, they were all seated around the big oak table, enjoying their feast. These burgers are amazing, said Mika, through a mouthful of burger. Thank you, replied Jason. The secret is the seasoning. I took my mother's recipe and added a few things. After they were finished and the table was cleared, they all sat at the table. Grandfather broke out his pipe and lit it. Soon the fragrance of the scented tobacco filled the room. The rich smell was both earthy and sweet. After a few long puffs, Grandfather leaned back in his chair and slowly looked around the table. This was a good day, he said, smiling. It is good to break bread with you. This is a celebration of life. We will mourn those we have lost when the task before us is done, but for now we rejoice that we'll pass the test and we are ready to finish this. That caused most of them to nod in agreement. No one spoke for fear of interrupting him. Sarah slipped her arm through Will's and leaned against his shoulder. We will rest tonight and begin tracking at first light, said Grandfather. The sun goes down early in the winter and we would only have a couple of hours to track. It's too dangerous to track them in the darkness. There they have all the advantage. What if they come for us tonight? asked Doc. I don't think that that will be the case, replied Grandfather. Their leader was hurt badly, perhaps even killed. They will have to find a new den and choose a new alpha. That'll buy us some time. 
Time for what? asked Ben. Time for everyone to rest and regain their strength, said Grandfather. Mika has recovered well, but Thomas and Jacob may not be able to join you at all. They both took deep wounds. They will mend, but it will take time. Look, said Mika, pointing out the sliding glass door. They all turned and saw a magnificent sight. A large, bald eagle was perched on the railing of the deck, staring intently into the room with them. Anankasan, said Will, smiling. Indeed, added Grandfather. It is a sign. We are safe here tonight. Anunkasan is watching over us all. The eagle turned around and faced the woods below. It made no attempt to fly away, but sat like a guardian looking out over the woods. Anunkasan whispered the wind. Chapter 19. Bad Omens. A very great vision is needed and the man who has it must follow it as the eagle seeks the deepest blue of the sky. Crazy Horse, Sioux Chief Will awoke long before the others. He slipped out of bed and stood to stretch. It was well before dawn, but he felt completely rested and awake. In fact, he felt better than he had in a long, long time. Padding down the hallway and into the living room, he was careful not to make any noise to wake the others. He knew that they would all need their rest for the task that lay ahead of them today. Tracking the Olonga Daglala was going to be very difficult between the snow and the frozen ground. As Will approached the sliding glass door, he saw that a fresh layer of snow had fallen during the night. The large flakes were still coming down despite having already deposited more than six inches on the ground. Tracking isn't going to be easy, said Will. May be impossible. The newly fallen snow would have completely covered any tracks left behind. There would be no trail to follow. They were going to have to find another way, and at the rate the snow was falling, tracking on foot was going to be problematic. Deep snow would slow their progress to a crawl. Will sensed the presence behind him. He felt no threat, but instantly recognized the scent of Sarah. Slipping her arms around him, she held him close to her with her face pressed up against his back. Are you okay? she asked. Yeah, replied Will. I woke up and couldn't go back to sleep, so I thought I'd check the weather. All that snow's going to make things tougher, she added. Oh, definitely, said Will. We might not be able to track them at all. Then how do we find them? she asked, concern in her voice. Maybe Grandfather will know a way, said Will. Tracking through a snowstorm is beyond my abilities. Then we'll ask him when he wakes up, she said. She turned around and Will wrapped his arms around her. I don't understand, he whispered. Understand what, she asked. How is it that we've only known each other for a few days, yet I feel drawn to you, he said. I can't explain it. I feel it as well, she replied even before I had my vision. When this is all over, he said, pulling her close, I want to go away with you and take some time to truly get to know you. Where would you want to go? she asked, smiling up at him. Where doesn't matter, he replied, and so long as we're together. Will felt drawn to kiss her. They were getting closer and their lips almost touching when a voice broke the silence. I hope I'm not interrupting anything, said Grandfather. Will and Sarah separated quickly and turned toward the sound of the voice. Grandfather had just walked into the room. Good morning, Grandfather, said Will. Good morning, he replied. I apologize for startling you. Oh, it's okay, said Sarah. We'll finish our conversation later. I certainly hope we can, whispered Will. I hope we didn't wake you, said Sarah. Not at all, said Grandfather. I like to wake up early and listen to the silence of the morning. I watch the sun rise over the valley. Have you seen the weather forecast today? asked Will. Yes, said Grandfather. They're calling for heavy snow all day. As much as ten inches are supposed to fall by evening. So much for tracking, said Will. Don't give up hope, said Grandfather. We will find a way. 
Turning toward the kitchen, Grandfather walked over and picked up his percolator coffee pot. Coffee? he asked without looking over his shoulder. Of course, said Sarah. I'll have a cup, said Will, smiling. Grandfather set to the task of making coffee, and Sarah went into the kitchen to start preparing for breakfast. Will was just about to join her when he heard his cell phone ringing in the bedroom. I'll be right back, said Will, heading back to the bedroom at the end of the hall. Gray Eagle, he said as he held the phone up to his ear. The number that had appeared on the screen didn't have a name with it, so he knew it wasn't someone that he had given his number to. Detective Gray Eagle, said the voice. This is Detective Weddle with the Cameron County Sheriff's Office. Detective Weddle, said Will, frowning. Is something wrong? I apologize for calling you so early, said Weddle, but I wanted to let you know that we've had another attack last night. Where? asked Will. What happened? It's here in Cameron County, said Weddle, close to Hatanka State Park. We got a call around midnight from a park ranger who said he located a vehicle parked near the campground. The windows were broken out and there was blood everywhere. Are there any bodies? asked Will. Nope, replied Weddle. They're gone, but there was a lot of blood. There's no way they survived that. What about the park ranger? asked Will. Did he see anything? I don't know, said Weddle. He was going to hold the scene for us until I could get there. And when I arrived, I found his truck still running and his duty pistol on the ground by the bloody car. The slide was locked back and there was brass everywhere. There was also a bloody patch of snow where we found the gun. He didn't go down without a fight, said Will. He most certainly did not, agreed Weddle. I'm already processing the scene, but I thought I'd let you know. This has to be related to the other two attacks. Absolutely, replied Will. Anything else? There were a bunch of tracks on the ground, said Weddle. They have to be bear tracks. I've never seen a dog or a wolf track that big. Did you follow the tracks? asked Will. We tried, said Weddle. They just vanished once they hit the tree line. Do you mind if I come take a look at the scene? asked Will. I don't mind, said Weddle, but there isn't much to go on. No bodies left behind this time, just a shitload of blood. Where exactly is the crime scene? asked Will. Near the visitor center at the campground, said Weddle. Now drive carefully, the roads are getting nasty with all this snow. Thanks, said Will, hanging up the phone. Returning to the kitchen, Will told Grandfather and Sarah about the phone call. So why did they attack those people? asked Sarah. They left their old den, said Grandfather. They were gathering food for the new one. I would gamble that's in that area. There are a lot of caves in that park, said Will. Plus the lake always has people near it, even in the dead of winter. Food, water, shelter, said Grandfather. That's exactly what they're looking for. What about the Alpha? asked Sarah. I thought you said it would take time for them to choose a new one. Not if the old one survived, said Will. I lived through the fight, and I suppose he could have as well. I thought I did enough damage to kill it, but maybe not. Well now, said Grandfather, at least we have a place to start. I'll wake the others, said Sarah, heading down the hall. Will headed into the bedroom and started getting dressed. He slipped into a pair of jeans and a black t-shirt, and he reached for his black zip-sided tactical boots. He paused just before he picked them up, and then reached for the moccasin boots that his cousin had made for him. What the hell, whispered Will. Grabbing his nylon cobra belt, he slipped it through the belt loops, and with his mag pouch and holster in place, he checked the load on the Hellcat X2. Satisfied that it was loaded, he slipped it into the holster. And picking up his jacket, he put four more loaded mags in his jacket pocket. And as an afterthought, he grabbed a fixed blade knife and slid it into the top of his moccasin boots. And as he turned to head into the living room, Sarah walked in. Everyone is getting ready, she said, looking concerned. Good, replied Will. I'll go check out the crime scene and I'll call you guys in when I know the area we're going to have to search. 
Don't go alone, she said, her tone full of concern. I won't, he assured her. I'll take Doc with me. We won't go after them until you are there with us. You'd better not, she said, scowling at Will. As they walked back into the living room, Will saw that everyone was there putting their gear together for the hunt. What's the plan, said Mika. We head for the area and most of you will hang back while I go check out the crime scene, explained Will. Doc will come with me. Once I have a trail to follow, I'll tell you where to meet us. That's fair enough, said Mika. We'd better get moving. All right, said Will. Let's go hunting. Doc grabbed his coat and his go bag, and Will checked the load on all of his guns and slid them into his duffel. Grandfather, said Will, can I borrow your truck? I don't think the charger's going to handle this much snow. Without a word, Grandfather tossed him the keys to his old red Toyota four-wheel drive truck. Bring it back with a full tank, said Grandfather, smiling. Heading out the door, Will grabbed an old broom from the porch and began sweeping snow off the windshield and the windows of the truck. And once it was clear, he started the engine and let it begin warming up. While it was warming, Doc and Will scraped the ice from the windows, and they both froze when they heard a blood-curdling cry from behind them. Will whirled around with his pistol drawn to find that he was drawing down on a screech owl. It sat perched on a tree branch about 30 feet away, making no attempt to hide. It watched him with a curious expression, and then it screeched again. What the fuck is that? asked Doc, running around the truck with his own pistol drawn. It's a screech owl, Will said, pointing. That thing scared the hell out of me, said Doc, holstering his pistol. Well, it should, said Will. To my people, an owl is a death omen. Well, shit, said Doc. Now that's not good. Well, let's hope that it isn't meant for us, said Will, putting his pistol away and going back to scraping ice. They climbed in and turned up the heater. Will put it in four-wheel drive and slipped it into reverse. Carefully avoiding the other vehicles, he backed into an empty spot and turned around. And he could see the others were also getting their vehicles ready to go. Shouldn't we wait for them? asked Doc. No, replied Will. We need to get to the crime scene. Besides, my cousin Jason is with them. He knows how to get to Hahatanka. The roads were covered with snow and rarely plowed this far out in the county. Will knew that they wouldn't find cleared roads until they reached the little town of Eldridge. They rode in silence for a while. Doc didn't want to break Will's concentration on the treacherous roads. And when they passed a sign that read Cameron County, Doc finally spoke. How much further, he asked. Not far, said Will. We should reach the turnoff of the campground in a few minutes. Well, how do you want to play this? Doc asked, glancing over at Will. I'm not a cop. I'll tell them you're with me, said Will, smiling. It shouldn't be an issue. Will began decelerating slowly to avoid sliding. He turned onto a side road with a wooden sign indicating the Hahatanka campground and public fishing access. Doc noticed that they were now surrounded by thick woods. Even with the leaves all gone, it was difficult to see very far into the trees. Up ahead, they saw the flashing lights of emergency vehicles. The sun was just starting to turn the eastern sky a dark red color, with most of the area still covered in darkness. They're here, whispered Doc. I can feel it. Will didn't answer. Just ahead was two Cameron County patrol chargers partially blocking the road. Will slowed to a stop and rolled down his window. A deputy in uniform of the Cameron County Sheriff's officers approached the window with a flashlight in his left hand and his right on the grip of his pistol. I'm sorry, folks, but this area is closed, said the deputy. You'll have to turn around and go back the way you came in. I am Detective Will Gray Eagle from Lackland County, explained Will. Detective Weddle is expecting me. What well, can I see your ID, sir? asked the deputy. Moving slowly to avoid making the deputy think he was going for a gun, he removed his wallet and opened it. 
and inside was his detective badge and department ID. After carefully looking over it, the deputy handed it back. One moment, sir, said the deputy. Keying up his radio, the deputy said, 415 to 307. Go ahead, was the reply. Sir, I've got Detective Gray Eagle from Lackland County here for you. Good, answered 307. Send him right in. Copy that, said the deputy. 415 clear. Nodding at Will, he motioned for him to go on through the checkpoint. Take the first right into the public access parking lot, said the deputy. Will do, said Will. Thank you. Heading out, Will rolled his window up. Doc, he said, I know you aren't a forensic expert, but take a look at the scene and tell me if you think that there's enough blood to kill the victims, or if there might be a chance they're still alive. Okay, no problem, said Doc. Turning into the parking area, Will pulled over and parked next to an unmarked charger with law enforcement plates. As soon as they exited the truck, Will could see Detective Weddle coming toward them. Behind him was an area that had been cordoned off with yellow crime scene tape, and on the far side of the tape were two vehicles. One, a green Park Ranger SUV, and the other was a gray pickup truck. Thank you for coming on such short notice, said Weddle, extending his hand as he approached. No problem answered Will, shaking the outstretched hand. Let me introduce my friend, Doc. He's with me. Doc, said Weddle, shaking his hand. Detective, answered Doc. If you'll follow me, said Weddle, turning back toward the crime scene, I'm afraid there's not much to see. I'm hoping you'll see something that I missed. I'll do my best, said Will. As they walked closer to the scene, Will could smell the coppery scent of blood. Mixed with it was the lingering smell of the Olonga Daglala. As they ducked under the tape, they could already see the blood. The interior of the truck had been covered with blood, almost as if someone had thrown a bucket into the interior. Next to the park ranger's SUV was a large pool of blood on the ground. It was still bright crimson and had frozen before it had fully congealed. Doc just met Will's gaze and shook his head. I don't think so, said Will. Worth checking, though. Careful not to step in any of the tracks or on the evidence, Will began slowly circling the crime scene. Weddle and Doc stayed back and let him work. Will took his time to gather every detail that he could. There were at least six of the creatures, thought Will. After carefully checking the area, Will returned to where Doc and Detective Weddle were waiting for him. You think it's the same thing? asked Weddle. I mean, what else could it be? It's the same thing, agreed Will. You said your men tracked them. Which way did they go? They headed down past those restrooms toward the island trail, said Weddle. That's where we lost them. Are there any of your men out there now still trying to track them? asked Doc. No, said Weddle. I thought that tracking them in the darkness wasn't very bright. After what we saw in the last crime scene, I didn't want to run into one of those fucking werewolves in the dark. So you saw them? asked Doc. Yeah, said Weddle. Well, I saw one. You mean there's more than one of those damn things? Yeah, there's a pack of them, said Will. We're not sure exactly how many. Well, shit, said Weddle. What do we do now? Finish processing the scene, said Will, and then get out of here. I'm going to call in a team of hunters to help me track them down and take them out. I've got ten armed deputies here, said Weddle. Do you want us to go with you? I think we've got it, said Will. Besides, they have special equipment to deal with these things. Without it, most guns are useless. What, like silver bullets or something? asked Weddle. Yeah, something like that, said Will. But if we can't handle it, you and your guys will have to finish the job. Well, I hope you guys finish it then, said Weddle. We've lost enough men for one year. Definitely agreed, said Will. I'll call you if we need anything. All right, said Weddle. We'll finish up here and clear the area. Heading back to the truck, Will took out his phone and called Mika. The conversation was brief, and Will told them where to meet 
and then he hung up. Taking out his bag, Will started getting his weapons ready and putting on his plate carrier. Doc did the same. By the time they were ready, several of the Cameron County vehicles had left, and Will watched as two tow trucks arrived and hooked up the two vehicles. They would both be towed back to the Cameron County offices to be processed as evidence. Once the last vehicle cleared the parking lot, Will sent a text to Mika telling him it was clear to proceed. A few minutes later, three vehicles pulled in, two pickup trucks and one large SUV. And as they all began to get out of the vehicles, off in the distance, they heard a mournful howl of a large wolf. I don't suppose that's an actual wolf, asked Doc. There hasn't been a confirmed wolf sighting in this part of Missouri in more than a hundred years, said Will. Well, shit, said Doc. I was afraid of that. As the others gathered their equipment, Will watched the area looking for any sign of the dog men. The clouds had parted and the moon shone brightly in the night sky. Stars glimmered coldly in the crisp air. High above them, perched atop a massive cliff face, was the ruins of the Ohahatanka Castle. It had been built by the Snyder family back in the early part of the 20th century. Will had been coming here to swim, fish, and walk the trails since he was a small boy, and he knew this area as well as he knew the land around his grandfather's house. Soon everyone gathered around to begin planning the next phase. Will continued to watch the area, searching for any signs of movement. Once he was satisfied that nothing was in the immediate area, he turned and faced the others. Oh, we've got our work cut out for us tonight, he said. Where do we start? asked Mika. There are dozens of caves all over this area, explained Will. Some of them are too small to handle the pack, but there are still plenty of larger caves, too. Where do you think the most likely place to start would be? asked Doc. There is a cave on that island, he said, gesturing toward the trail. That would be the most likely place. It's also easy to defend. However, there are a number of places that they could go. How many do you think are left? asked Mika. Well, it's hard to guess, answered Will. We don't know how many there were to begin with, much less how many we've actually killed. Maybe there are only a few left, suggested Jason. Well, that's unlikely, replied Will. I saw tracks at the crime scene that indicated at least six took part in the attack. And some of them would have remained with the wounded, added Mika. We have to assume that they outnumber us. Let's move, said Will. The deputies lost their tracks, but I'd be willing to bet that they aren't as good as we are. Let's get hunting. Everyone did a quick weapons check and headed down the trail toward the sign that read Island Trail. There were clear tracks to follow until they reached the end of the cleared parking lot. Once the trail entered the trees, the tracks vanished. Will began searching one side of the trail while Mika and Jason searched for the other. After several minutes, Jason called out to the others. I've got something, he said, just loud enough for them to hear him. Will and Mika joined him to see what he had found, and there in the fresh snow were three bright crimson spots where blood had hit the ground. No tracks were visible, they only saw the blood. They went into the trees, said Mika. They're clever bastards, said Jason. That's going to make it tough to follow them. Not as much as you might think, said Will. What do you mean? asked Mika. Do you see how the blood drops are shaped? said Will, pointing. You can tell the direction of travel from the blood. They were moving toward the island. Which means they're going to have to come out of the trees to cross the bridge, said Jason, smiling. That's right, said Will. Let's move. Hurrying down the trail, Will took the lead. and In just a few minutes, they had reached the small wooden bridge that led from the main trail to the island trail. There in the fresh snow were large canine footprints leading across the bridge. There were also several more blood drops. The trail runs full circle around the island, said Will. Let's split into two parties and meet on the far side. That's where the cave's at. 
How will we know if you find something before we get there? asked Samuel. I'd say the gunfire will probably give it away, replied Mika with a grin. Fair enough, said Samuel. The group split and headed in opposite directions. Mika took half and Will took the other. Mika had taken the path that led them closer to the cliff face while Will took the path that ran beside the open waters of the Lake of the Ozarks. There was a thick layer of ice on the lake, but if it was thick enough to support weight, was anyone's guess. Doc stayed right on Will's heels as they made their way along the narrow trail. They were now moving as quickly as they could without making too much noise. Just as they were about to turn the corner, Will held his hand up for everyone to stop. They all stopped and knelt down behind whatever cover they could find. What do you see? whispered Doc. I've got one of them up ahead, said Will. He's crouched down trying to break a hole in the ice to get a drink. Do you see any of the others? asked Sarah. No, just the one, replied Will. I'll take him out, said Doc. I've got the only suppressed weapon here. Take the shot, said Will. Easing up past Will, Doc lay prone on the ground and steadied his Novesky AR and began sighting in. Putting the red dot reticle on the side of the creature's head, he began to take up the slack on the trigger. Just as he was about to take the shot, the creature turned and looked directly at him. The eerie yellow eyes seemed to glow as it stared directly at him. Doc knew it had seen him and had only seconds before it alerted the others. The Novesky AR coughed three times in rapid succession, striking the beast right between those glowing yellow orbs. And through the optic, Doc saw blood, brains, and bone fly into the air, knocking the beast over backwards and onto the ice. The momentum sent it sliding out away from the shore. The sound of ice crackling sounded like a haunting melody, echoing off the cliffs and rocks around them. The body slid to a stop ten feet from the shore, where it sat for a moment before the ice began to give way and the beast slipped into the frigid dark water, vanishing completely beneath the ice. Nice shot, Doc, said Will. One down, said Doc, getting back to his feet. Let's get going, whispered Will. Watch the trees in case there are others moving around. Picking up their pace, they continued on around the island trail. After a few minutes, they could see the other group coming toward them. Mika held up his hand and motioned for them to stop. Will stopped his team with a hand gesture, and they all crouched down. Mika made eye contact with Will and mouthed silently while pointing toward the backside of the large boulder just in front of Will. They're back there, Mika whispered. You are listening to Apex Predator, Wolf Moon. Written by D.A. Roberts. Read to you by Cameron Buckner. Print copyright by Douglas Roberts. Audio production copyright by Cameron Buckner. Reproduction of this audio in any way is prohibited by U.S. copyright laws without written approval. Stay tuned to the Dixie Cryptid channel, codename Wild Hunt, Operation Blood Eagle.